Good morning and welcome from LA to the Coinbase Institutional Markets Call. It's about 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 midday Eastern. And we have got another cracking lineup after a bit of an uptick in the market over the weekend, which I have to say was very, very encouraging. Greg, what did you think of the price action? Obviously, I'm sure you were happy to see it, but what was uh, what were your initial thoughts? Yeah, you know, last week we were rescued a bit by uh, at first a more dovish than expected Jay Powell and then cooler than expected uh, non-farm payroll numbers. So uh, did help price action quite a bit. Um, we have a pretty quiet calendar ahead of us this week. Um, so I expect we're going to trade probably in line with equities. Um, but, you know, we get surprises uh, every day. So we'll have to see. Can't wait for those surprises. Always fun to deal with. Now, back to our agenda. So we've got a great conversation with Daddy Christensen, managing partner at Visca Digital Assets. Um, so we're going to be running through how they think about the market uh, and some of their performance over the last couple of years, which is super, super interesting. We're also going to run through a market update with George. Um, we'll go into macro in a bit more detail with David, Greg, and the team. Uh, Greg will then also take us through an ETF update, which we've had some interesting things come out of the last week, things we've not seen actually since the launch, um, and, a, and a good turnaround in flows there, which is, which is good. So we'll go into that into more detail and also an update on Hong Kong ETFs too. But without further ado, we are super, super excited to welcome Daddy Christensen, managing partner at Visca Digital Assets, to the show today. Welcome, Daddy. Thank you, Ben. Uh, nice to be with you guys. So Visca Digital Assets are a digital asset firm based in Iceland that launched in July of 2022. Now, that was a pretty challenging time to launch, for sure. That said, yeah. your returns that year were 10%, 23, 2023, you're up 62 and then so far this year, you're up 70%. So you guys have performed very, very well, and congrats on that. Um, now, one question, one question I kind of always ask when uh, when we have guests on that have come from TradFire, because prior to crypto, you, you spent your time at um, various investment banks is like why why did you come to crypto what was it that allured you to um to the other side uh it was uh i was trying to to find some you know decent investments for for me personally uh and uh, uh i was trying to look you know outside of iceland uh and it was uh, you know it was like 2018 19 and you you're looking at the bond market you're looking at the uh, the stock market uh and i just really didn't see the opportunities especially i found the bond market was broken uh there were very low yields uh you know and uh the outlook for bonds and for my view has been very bad for years uh so i i, I kind of uh, ran into bitcoin like for uh, as a like a kind of a coincidence i didn't know anything about it and and that was kind of my my gateway into this industry. I started investing in Bitcoin, uh, reading up on it, and and as you know, a lot of the people in the industry they fell fall deep down this rabbit hole. And uh, I I always say you know the more you study it, the more obvious it is that it makes sense. Uh, then from there you start to you know explore other cryptocurrencies. You start to understand how. How this, uh, how the blockchain te technology will change the infrastructure of the financial system. Uh, so you know, you just at some point you just can't look back. Uh, once once you see, you can't unsee, as they say. So, so that was kind of uh, my, uh, and I and I I just traded. You know, me and a, a you know a co-founder of Visca. We uh, we've been in TradFi for 15 years, and we were just you know doing our, our regular jobs and and trading crypto. You know, during you know the evenings and. And at one point, we met up with these guys, uh, like crypto OGs here in Iceland that have been in Bitcoin mining and very tax savvy guys that are. Uh, and we we started to we, we decided to start a fund together. And uh, and that has been uh, you know, an amazing journey. Very cool. Very cool. So to help us understand, how does Visca allocate capital? Uh, so so we are a liquid, uh, long discretionary fund. We, we, are, we have a long bias. Uh, so. Uh, what we want to do for our clients is to capture the upside of this uh, amazing industry, you know, which we feel will outgrow every other asset class in the coming years. However, there are uh, massive uh, drawdowns. Uh, if you look at the cyclicality of the space, there are times when you have to be cautious. So, so we want to be, you know, uh, that's why we were very macro focused. And uh, that's the reason why we were up in 22, because we, 
we felt that that was the time to be passive, to be cautious. So we have a long bias looking, you know, but we're not always long, uh, obviously. And uh, so, so this is kind of how we, how we view things. Uh, recently, we've been very long Bitcoin because that's where the flows have been. Uh, the ETFs was one of the biggest news in the history of, of the crypto industry. So, so that's, that has been kind of the best risk reward uh, for the past few months. But uh, we can we can go deeper into our our allocations if you want. But uh, let's. Stay. I mean, I think I think our our, our uh, listeners are very very kind of clear on the the Bitcoin narrative, and, and we talk about it a lot, and obviously very involved. In yeah. This, yeah. So I think we think we we get there. But let's. I'd love to kind of hear your views around Solana because I know that's an area that you're also very um, enthusiastic about. Um, yeah. And perhaps I, I think we um, often cover a lot about Ethereum. So curious to kind of hear your views around Solana and. and um, how you think about that going forwards? Yeah, we we are. I mean, Solana is our second biggest position. We're, we have been impressed by uh, the resilient, like how resilient the network has been for the past year. Obviously, it was uh, it had a big uh, catastrophic event uh, with FTX going down, and uh, the Solana was a very like FTX kind of linked chain uh, and. Uh, uh, it, it showed in the price and the price fall uh, in 22 and, and early 23. But uh, uh, we feel that we see activity picking up. There's a lot of dev activity. Uh, it's a very fast, uh, it's a very cheap and fast uh, network. And, and maybe that's something that Ethereum has struggled with. So uh, we have kind of uh, been of the opinion that Ethereum is uh, trying to be, you know, Bitcoin and Solana all at once. Uh, it, you can, I think it's difficult to be, you know, sound money and, uh, you know, a fast uh, sm smart contract uh, network. Uh, obviously, there are, are there are actions being taken on Ethereum by layer twos, uh, but but I feel Solana has uh, a better potential, and I also feel the the uh, Investment professionals are very ETH centric, uh, so I think we will see more flows coming to Solana uh, because, at least our opinion is that most uh, investment professionals are very ETH focused and have big, you know, big uh, portions of their portfolios in ETH, uh, and I think Solana is massively underestimated by many. They have obviously a massive upgrade coming and in, in the later in the year, the Fire Dancer upgrade, which is very exciting, which will uh, obviously increase decentralization. It will uh, increase uh, the the it will be faster and 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 more resilient. So we find that also very uh, that's a that's an exciting event coming up. Interesting, and, and I'm curious. I guess when we look at the ecosystem now, much of the kind of TVL and DeFi activity is is on Ethereum. Um, yeah. Whereas more of the, the kind of the memes and, and deep in actually, to be fair as well, is kind of on Solana. Do, do you see a world where we continue to kind of have specific chains for specific use cases? Or do you expect to see DeFi activity and things like that move across to Solana? Like, how are you thinking about that? I mean, ETH, ETH has a massive history. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's just a matter of what you're trying to do. I mean, if you have, if you want uh, faster and cheaper, Solana is always going to be your bet. But uh, I, I can, it, it makes sense that a lot of stuff goes on uh, on Ethereum rather than Solana. It's, it's just uh, a more trusted network at this point in time. And I, I think that won't really change that fast. Uh, so, so it's just a matter of what you're trying to do. Uh, I think there is room for Ethereum, definitely. Uh, we just think Solana will outpace them, outrun them. Uh, so we have been kind of uh, of the opinion that it makes more sense to belong Bitcoin and Solana rather than Ethereum. Uh, we are bullish on all of these uh, against the dollar. Uh, I think crypto will, will grow massively in the coming months and years. So. So I'm not, we're not saying that Ethereum is failing or anything like that. But when you look at Ethereum and, and you, you just transact on it, it's, it's, uh, it can be frustrating. And, and then you have all these L2s kind of competing against each other. Uh, so interests aren't aligned. 
in, in, at, at least not in all cases. So, but that's not the case with Solana. So that's kind of what I'm, uh, how I view things. That's super interesting, Daddy. And uh, I definitely agree with your Solana thesis. Um, I and, and I think actually, I mean, obviously looking back towards the last week, right? Like when obviously we were uh, in this deep correction, right? And you could see that, you know, thesis play out actually because Solana in the end was one of the, the, the let's say the, the, the coins that bounced the quickest uh, yeah. and uh, outperformed both against and uh, Sol versus ETH, but Sol versus BTC as well. And that's that's despite these uh, FTX estate, you know, deals that have been going on, which is kind of a supply thing. Uh, but it hasn't really slowed Solana that much down. Uh, it, 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 I think it shows there is uh, massive interest underlying for, for this asset. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, and in that context, I mean, one, one thing that, that we've discussed in this call in the past was um, sort of the, um, the competition between modular chains versus, let's say, high throughput chains, monolithic chains, right? And uh, I'm just curious about your take on how, obviously, you have a lot of, uh, without like going into any specific chains, but you have a lot of other really high throughput chains that can process a ton of transactions in very brief periods of time uh, pop up, let's say. So how do you see um, Solana fitting into that broader L1 uh, landscape? And do you think there could be other um, high throughput chains that could sort of um, maybe yeah. compete with Solana I mean, for that spot? For sure. I mean, we're constantly reevaluating our, our, our thesis. Uh, I mean, Solana is just furthest along uh, in, in, with this regard. I mean, there are some potentials out there. You have all these Facebook uh, L1s, you know, the Aptos and the Swiss and all that. Uh, I mean, they're they're just not near anywhere near where Solana is today. So, uh, I mean, we will, as I said, we will const constantly be evolving, you know, our thesis and and uh, reiterating what we're doing. And but as of this point, I th I don't see any uh, competitor being close to Solana as they are right now. Looking at dev activity, looking at you know how Solana has performed. Uh, in the past six months when all this meme frenzy has been going on. I mean, we feel that, you know, NFTs will grow on Solana. It's 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 going to be cheaper, all, all kinds of, you know, cultural stuff being built on that. Uh, so so that's, that's, uh, that's where the growth will be for the coming, you know, six to 12 months for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm kind of curious, actually, one thing that we've been thinking about too is how Solana, I feel like is not necessarily fair to compare directly to the Ethereum main chain, right? Because you have the L2s and all the L2 scalings, especially yeah. after Dan Kuhn and the 4844. I know a lot of the L2s now like base, for example, has, you know, typically has sub one cent transaction fees. So I'm kind of yeah. curious how you see the L2 scaling versus Solana evolve. Do you feel like the L2, the scaling roadmap there is just not as good? Do you feel like that it's it could be great, but it's not as good as um, Solana's roadmap, how do you kind of balance the Solana versus the L2 scaling debate? Well, uh, I, what I think, think is a, the, the problem with these L2s are like, who, who's going to be on top? Like they're, they're all kind of battling each other. I mean, and you guys, you know, at Coinbase, Base has been good, doing a great job, uh, but they are not working with OP or work with, you know, Arbitrum kind of, you know, everyone is kind of each in their own corner uh, trying to do the next L2. So, uh, as I stated earlier, the interests aren't aligned. This is not like an ecosystem where everyone is working together to to for the same goal. So, so that's kind of uh, it. It can be a problem. Uh, it's it's kind of you know maybe some one L two will just you know let's say base it will just take over. Uh, then it might be much more of a smooth transition from you know using eth using base uh but but as of now it's kind of you know a battle between all kinds of different l2s uh and and uh, it, it can get quite complicated yeah just to play um just to steel man the the counter argument here um i think it's also quite interesting though that well the opposite take would be that even as the l2s are fighting with each other essentially for market share all of them still use ETH as the base transaction fee. Yep. All of the rent storage to the L1s is all done in ETH as well. Um, and we've seen more bridged ETH today to these rollups than we saw even at the peak of previous cycles of bridged ETH to other ecosystems. Um, one thing as well that I think is pretty interesting about L2s is that because they're so um, 
I guess currently still quite centralized with the sequencers. You see a lot of innovation there. Um, so you have like you know Solana right now. You're kind of locked into the Rust and Anchor tooling. Um, there's some portability tools like Neon where you can do extra coding, but most of the developer tooling in Solana right now is in Rust. But upcoming, you have you know um, Eclipse, which is going to be like a, a like a Rust based L2. Like with the Solana virtual machine, you have Movement Labs, which is taking over the Move language over to an L2. And I think that you're going to start seeing more and more. Um, variations in developer tooling. Certainly, um, the cross-chain um, fragmentation problem and the user experience might still be heavily impacted, but it's also quite exciting to see how you're going to have more and more faster innovations at the alto level um, once Lana gets more ossified. I mean, certainly, yeah, fire dancing coming in, you have more scalability coming in, um, new upgrades. Um, but once you hit yep. a point of decentralization, it's going to slow down um, inevitably, right? That's point of decentralization. Yeah, what, what is your view on fire dancer? I mean, that's that's uh, it will be interesting to see. Oh yeah, I think Fire Dancer is is great. I'm very much looking forward to that. I think right now Ethereum really is the only smart contract platform with real client diversity, which is why it has uptime. Um, Solana Fire Dancer is going to be the second client. I mean, yeah. the second real diverse client. Um, and I think one thing that's a little bit, I think the market doesn't really understand as much right now though, is that just because Fire Dancer is there doesn't mean that the entire chain's throughput is going to 10x overnight, right? Because you're balanced in between these clients. I think the analogy that some of the jump guys have used is like it's going to be like a Ferrari stuck in traffic. Um, because even though finance can go super, super fast, you're going to need the other clients to also level up um, in order to maintain yeah. that higher throughput. So I think that, yes, finance is going to be great. I think it's, but I think the bigger change there is also going to be for um, just more better chain uptime in the short term and the longer term, better scalability. Although once you start mm -hmm. to have two clients, then these rollouts come slower, right? Because once you update the execution layer, you need to make sure all the clients do all their testing. And I think this is one thing that might be a little bit underappreciated on the ETH side is that it's very, very difficult to transition from a centralized lab or unit developing all these clients into some sort of decentralized network with these diverse stakeholders still cooperating together for all these upgrades. Um, mm -hmm. Solana looks to be moving in that, direction, but in that direction, but it's going to take some time to kind of figure out what that process will look like um, in the long term if they have, say, three, four or five clients um, down the road. You know, who's going to be yeah. leading these calls? What kind of foundations are going to be set up, et cetera? But, you know, and, and, and for, for ETH, obviously... For ETH, obviously, there might be a massive catalyst in the ETF approval, but it doesn't look that it's coming anytime soon. I mean, maybe later this year, perhaps beginning of next year. I don't know. I mean, I don't think there are many uh, hoping for an ETF now in May. It seems to be, you know, not happening. But uh, yeah, I mean, that, obviously, that is uh, that could be a massive catalyst for ETH uh, if that happens. It will be very interesting to follow that. Yeah, David, we'd love to hear from you on this one because I know you actually, uh, you're probably on the more positive side there. I think the market is probably pricing this at close to zero, but but I know yeah, you're slightly, sure. more, slightly more constructive, David. So yeah, what, do you want to just give us a kind of a quick rundown on why you're more constructive? Yeah, certainly. I think the, um, well, the, currently I feel like the market is pricing close to zero. I think you look at this, um, either in poly market, their odds I believe are like 10% right now in terms of May approvals. Um, I think the bigger tell is the ETH e-discount um, is around 25%. So your opportunity yeah. cost there, if you... Um, spy ETH, stake it, minus the management fees is still around uh, pricing in like essentially a four years out approval in terms of missed yield. Um, I think for me, the the matter of, you know, an ETH ETF approval is more of a question of when, not if. Um, if we have a new administration, uh, you know, four years out, essentially you're going to be not even talking about the next administration. It's like the next, next administration will already be in the talks at that point. Um, so I think the market is definitely underpricing that. I think there's more possibilities of surprises to see the upside. I think if we don't get an approval in May, I don't think you're going to see a big dump because um, it's been pretty well telegraphed at this point. Um, yeah. As for the reasoning, you know, co correlation and securities are the two main ones I've been seeing going around. I know Coinbase, we've pushed out our own correlation, correlation analysis where we feel like it's quite similarly correlated. Um, the futures in spot, as we saw with Bitcoin, which is the reason why they approved the Bitcoin ETF. That was their reasoning. And I think the securities one... Um, as a possibility, although we're not sure if the SEC wants to take that fight because that would lead to some interagency conflicts between them and the CFTC, which has come out and said that explicitly that ETH is not um, a security. So I think there might be the reasoning for approval might not be known um, yet, it might be something out of left field. And I think that's something that we're very closely watching for on the May 23rd first deadline. I, I definitely agree on, on you know, ETH, ETH ETF is coming. It's just a matter of time. Uh, and I also agree that uh, the ETH E uh discount is getting quite attractive so that's uh that's an interesting way to play it for sure i mean when it's over like 25 percent uh that's 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 quite a hefty discount yeah certainly and and so talking about kind of i guess eth is a derivative of eth in in one way talking about kind of other um derivatives like how do you look at the 
ecosystem in general, Daddy? Like, what products do you choose to trade and, and why? Uh, yeah, so so we can we can go long, you know, up to uh, 150 percent of equity. So we have been using perps when 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 that uh, when we want to be longer than 100 uh, uh, percent. But we have a re very strict counterparty policy. So uh, we have been using Coinbase, for example, which is you know a properly regulated uh, properly regulated entity, a trusted counterparty, been in the space for long. Uh, but there aren't. Uh, there aren't that many proper counterparties offering perps. So we were happy when and Coinbase uh, started with the international exchange. So we have been using that. Uh, and that's been uh, very good, obviously, uh, hoping to see that scale in, in the coming months. Uh, but we've also used uh, another another perp exchange, uh, which is which is uh, so, so, so that has been our, our, our flavor. When we are long, we're using perps for Bitcoin. We usually spot in, in the alts if, we, if, we're, if we're long alts because it's just cheaper. So, so that is basically how, we, how we, we've been playing things. Cool. Very, very cool. Yeah, I, I think I agree, certainly. Well, firstly, thank, thank you very much for being a client and, and utilizing the perps. I'm certainly keen to see that grow as well. I think what's interesting about the space in general is that over the last five years, innovation just doesn't stop. Um, whether it's onshore US or offshore, um, people are innovating and creating new products. And um, it's great to see because the space is just so, so dynamic. Um, but Dali, yeah. thank you so much for, for joining. Hope you'll stay with us for the rest of the call and, and get involved in the conversation. Um, but yeah, thank you very much Happy for joining. And we'll pass across to George for a market update, which actually was kind of like a positive we're kind of in a positive, uh, positive kind of mood, positive vibe, which is which is good for a change. Yeah, yeah, hundred hundred percent. Going from the the big picture uh, positive uh, macro narrative that we just discussed with Daddy, obviously to a, a, a equally positive and bullish uh, microstructure, I would say. So, uh, pretty big uh, turnaround there in the market in terms of uh, price action, but also in terms of sentiment, I would say, over the last week. Um, so BTC is currently trading around 63, 64K, and that's after testing um, 56.5K last week uh, on, on Wednesday. So pretty significant move. And I think the, the main reason is essentially more uh, dovish um, Fed, which we'll obviously get to um, uh, a little bit later in the call. Um, I think uh, from a TA perspective, um, the, the key things are to watch the key moving averages, to watch are still the 200 period EMAs and SMAs on the four hour chart in BTC. And then, in fact, we did actually yesterday when we, when we tested 66K on BTC, we did get rejected there and hence um, the, 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 the slight correction um, uh, over the last 24 hours or so. Uh, but I think that should be setting the tone uh, for um, the, the broader market. So the million dollar question is really, um, whether um, last week Wednesday now marks the the maximum extent of the dip, or uh, if this uh, was another uh, local low, um, given everyone was watching, obviously the 51, 52k area is the the ultimate support. Um, and you know, looking at, at upside scenarios, I mean, the market does feel quite strong. I think uh, if we manage to consolidate and hold here around 64k. And the next uh, key level um, that we need to watch for daily closes would be 67k. And I think if, if the market manages to, to establish itself above that level, then um, a new all-time all -time high, all -time high uh, attempt should be um, pretty close. Perfect. So, George, you mind just summarizing the levels you're looking at? It sounds like 67k on the on the upside, ultimate support on the on the yeah. downside is 51, 52. But is there like an intermediate level on the downside which you're looking at as well? Yeah, for sure. So, so six sixty four, sixty seven uh, on 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 the upside, and uh, if, you, if you look at the charts, I think uh, around sixty k uh, is is that key intermediate level, and then after that, sort of, we'll we'll have to reassess uh, if we do get uh, down there again. Um, then uh, that might increase definitely the probability for fifty one, fifty two. Super helpful, David. So last week, as George mentioned, we we did get some kind of weaker macro data, which markets liked. Um, can you just kind of run us through the, the macro data of the last week and also what we've got upcoming to keep an eye on? Sure. Um, I guess the first big one was the FOMC meeting on April 30th, May 1st. Um, during that meeting, there was some fears that the Fed would actually even ra um, raise rates or hike rates. Um, so there was a lot of fears that the Fed was going to like lean more and more hawkish, which would mean a stronger U.S. dollar, um, given that other banks around the world are looking to still looking to cut uh, starting in mid to late summer. Um, but during the meeting, Powell came out and said that rate cuts are 
quote, unlikely. Um, and he also went and announced a tapering of the balance sheet runoff more than anticipated from $60 billion a month of runoff to $25 billion a month of runoff, which assuaged a lot of these fears. So I think that kind of put a stop in a lot of the upward US dollar momentum. The second big print was on Friday, which is the non-farm payrolls release, which was below expectations. I mean, payroll still increased, but the below expectations print did suggest some early cooling in the uh, labor market, which um, is a very big shift from the start of the year where you know non-farm payrolls prints you know, constantly surprise to the upside. Um, so I think the main thing is that it stopped US dollar momentum. And that's really important for crypto because a lot of crypto, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, for example, they're all priced um, in USD across most exchanges. Perfect. So, and you, you actually wrote about this kind of the short term peak in uh, the dollar as well. So, I guess that's kind of validated your thesis, and you kind of hope to see that continue uh, subject to data, presumably. Certainly. Perfect. Okay, great. And then what, what what else are we looking for? What um, I think we've got CPI on the fifteenth, Nvidia earnings on the twenty second. Um, we've got thirteen F filings, which we'll, we'll cover in an ETF update in a second with Greg. Is there is there anything else that you're kind of keeping an eye on? Um, that might be a catalyst for the market one way or the other? Yeah, I think the big things to look are just general economic prints around how the economy is doing. I think right now we're quite in a more of an uncertain economic position where on the one hand, um, people want to say higher for longer because of high inflation. On the other hand, there are signs of a slowly weakening consumer market, whether that be from you know missed earnings and some of these consumer heavy um, firms that came out over the last week or two. Um, as well as you know the, the non-farm payable sprint and some of the under expect under below expectation um, manufacturing expectations. So I think generally trying to find some directional clarity on whether inflation might be a bigger problem or an economic slowdown might be a bigger problem for the Fed going forward. Super helpful. Um, Daddy, we'd love to bring you back here. Do you, would you kind of broadly agree there uh, in terms of like outlook from a macro perspective for the next few weeks? Yeah, I mean, uh, this was a huge meeting, the FOMC meeting uh, last Wednesday. Or when... when uh, the the QT uh, tapering was bigger than anticipated. So uh, we are of the opinion in, in Visca that the liquidity conditions are about to improve massively in the coming, you know, 12, 18 months. It's not going to happen, you know, in, 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 in one go, but this is just the debt loaded system needs. It needs liquidity. We've seen it time and time again. Uh, and uh, now, even though inflation has been higher than expected, we see, you know, the Fed doing more uh, than expected with the tapering. So that's that's a very positive. We also saw, you know, Japan uh, intervening right after the meeting. Uh, so I think we're going to see the dollar, you know, weaken a bit. And it has been. That's good for risk assets. So I think all in all, liquidity conditions are looking pretty good. Uh, the, num- the CPI numbers on the 15th are important, but... Uh, I think the outlook is pretty good. I mean, we it, it didn't look too good at 57K, you know, before the meeting last week. Uh, 52K was kind of, you know, being uh, realistic, you know, with that we would have to test that. But then, then we got this kind of bullish or dovish me- meeting, which uh, helped us reclaim 60K and, 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 and then some. So I'm pretty hopeful for the coming weeks. What a difference a day makes, hey? So much, uh, so yeah. much can change. And as we think about that, let's move to ETF. So, Greg, there were some big differences in a couple of days, admittedly, uh, in flows, uh, which I think have probably helped the market a little bit. Can you take us through that? Yeah, sure, Ben. Um, so, yeah, the big news in ETFs, the flows have been positive over the last two days. But, uh, but the big news is Grayscale actually saw its first two days of inflows since it converted on uh, Friday and then again yesterday. Um, and this is important because it means that the rotation out of Grayscale into some of these other products and maybe just you know out of uh, Grayscale entirely um, has come to an end or at least slowed quite a bit. Um, and now all these products will kind of trade on their own. Um, so definitely a positive to see there. Um, Hong Kong as well. It's one of its ETFs saw its first outflow. Um, you know, those ETFs are significantly smaller. We've talked about this uh, than the U.S. Uh, products. They have about uh, just around $250 million in assets. So, you know, a fraction of what we have uh, here in the U.S. Um, but we're still seeing trading volume there. And, you know, I expect we'll see inflows and outflows um, just like we do, you know, in any other market. Yeah, makes sense. You got your popcorn ready for the 15th with the uh, 13F filings? 
Yeah, like I said before, it'll be interesting to see kind of who's was in these at least on March 30th. Um, and, you know, it'll give us something to talk about. Um, <laughs> you need to caution. I need to caution people about reading too much into those um, because they are uh, somewhat dated. But, uh, but it'll certainly be interesting to see, you know, who's owned the ETFs in the past. I mean, I feel like we get what we have enough to talk about. I feel like the space keeps us pretty pretty busy, but uh, always nice to have a bit more for sure. Um, on that note, actually, so we were, we've covered it in the past, um, Athena, um, Athena Labs, and was interested for your perspective on this, Greg. Greg. So buy a bit of integrating USDE as a collateral asset. Um, so essentially, that allows people to hold a yield-bearing stablecoin and hold it as collateral if they're trading other assets, uh, other trading pairs. Um, there's a ton of other stablecoins looking to do the same thing, um, some with yield, some without. I'm curious kind of how you how you think about that and, and whether you think that might proliferate through our system. So, yeah, I saw that news. Um, I think it's just uh, indicative of the Athena ecosystem growing and, and wider adoption there. It's important to note that it's uh, this USDE that's being uh, accepted as collateral, not staked USDE. Um, so there is a slight nuance there. Um, but I think overall, it's you know positive for the space, positive for the product. And you know I'd expect to, to see more of it as uh, time goes by. So, Greg, just for our listeners that aren't familiar, can you just summarize the difference between USDE and staked USDE um, and maybe on like a return perspective as well? Yeah, of course. So USDE is the stable coin, uh, is Athena's stable coin. Um, you, know, you can then take that and stake that uh, and they use, you basically exchange your USDE for staked USDE. They use uh, you know what you've exchanged that USDE to then put on a basically perp funding trade where they're long ETH and short the perps, and that creates a yield that goes back to the staker. Um, you know it's a really interesting product. It uh, allows people uh, outside of the U.S. to easily participate in the perpetual uh, arb, uh, if you will. Um, and, you know, we've talked about it a lot in the past. They've seen, you know, considerable growth um, and, you know, but there are some risks to it. If per funding rates go negative for a long time, uh, the value of that staked product should decline, although there are uh, there is an insurance fund and some other things. Um, so it's a very interesting and innovative product and crypto is very good at doing interesting and innovative things. Um, so it's, yeah, it's something we're watching closely. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it doesn't surprise me at all that we're seeing, you know, USDE, uh, accepted as collateral on some of these exchanges. Nice. And in terms of difference in yield, so like staked USDE is around 15% at the moment. W what is the yield you're getting on USDE when it's not staked? Yeah. So if you have USDE, that's, that doesn't have a yield on its own. Uh, it's similar to having USDT in your wallet. You have a stable coin, you can exchange it for you know other tokens, um, but it won't pay you anything. It's not until after you stake it that you then have a yield bearing product. Um, now it is important to, to note because there's been some comparisons between staked USDE and um you know, the old Luna Terra project, the yield coming uh, to holders of staked USDE, you know, is actually a yield that's created uh, on exchanges through offering financing to, to perp traders. So it's not one that's being paid out of any treasury or anything like that. Um, so in that respect, it's, uh, you know, much uh, more resilient. Yeah, and a small uh, breadcrumb to next week. We've got Guy Young, the founder, on who's going to go through it in more detail. So excited to uh, to learn more about that. Now, staying on DeFi, David, uh, RVV4 and a 2030 announcement. That is, um, that's quite a roadmap. What what's going on there? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, Aave recently they released a temperature check around a 2030 roadmap. So it's a it's a three year plan for now, um, but they call it 2030. I'm guessing their developer time is going to extend. Um, as part of that, they also released another temperature check for their Aave version 4 release, um, which is the next iteration. They're currently on version 3. Um, and this comes with all the standard 
um, new architecture, reduced gas fees, anywhere from 30 to 50 percent, um, improvements to extendability. I think the most interesting thing about V4 is actually the increased focus to on their Go stablecoin, their GHO stablecoin that they've recently released. Um, and I think what is actually really, really cool about Ave 2030 and also where the, the protocol's direction is going is how it reminds me a lot about Maker's end game plan. Um, so you have two of the largest DeFi protocols, Ave and Maker. Ave is at 10, more than $10 billion in TVL, total value locked, and Maker's at $8.2 billion in TVL. They started to compete in market share of stable coins, lending. Um, they both want to equip their own networks. Um, and I think that it's quite cool where we're starting to see more and more of these OG DeFi protocols that we saw from last cycle in 2020, 2021 now are innovating um, and trying to see how they can continue to retain dominance over their their sectors and even compete for more market share. Great. I guess it's it's, continue, it's great to see continued innovation um, as, as all of these protocols continue to build. And, and obviously the composability is something that is always super exciting. Um, Next thing I would love to touch on is just ETH's gas fees. We, we spoke about L2s earlier on and, and how that reduces the cost of transacting. But in fact, even on L1, uh, fees are actually pretty low at the moment. So those costs are, are quite low. Um, and as a result, the burn rate is, is also is also lower. And then the staking rewards are also lower. So David, what, what are some of the dynamics there that we should be looking for? And, and kind of why do you think this is? Yeah, certainly. Uh, so just for context for, for some of the, the viewers who don't know, um, ETH has a standard issuance rate for all the stakers. At the same time, it also burns some of the base transaction fees um, for everything that occurs on the L1 layer. Um, and as more and more demand for Ethereum L1 block space goes up, then you have more and more burns. And so right now you see uh, a less demand for L1 block space in part because you have alternative L1s like Solana, you have L2s now, um, which can compress some of these transactions. So a lot of these meme coins, for example, or some of the other DeFi activity has been migrating out to other chains. Um, at that said, um, I don't know if I don't think that this is like a big warning sign or anything. Um, the ETH inflation rate currently is still at 0.5% a year, which is less than Bitcoin's inflation rate, even after the, the halving two weeks ago. Um, so ETH is still a very, very slightly inflationary asset um, sitting at it today. Um, we've, we've done some analysis on, on ETH demand, and actually we found that most of the Ethereum gas demand actually comes from transactions, um, whether that's on Uniswap or via Telegram bots, et cetera. And we've seen generally less volatility in the markets over the last few weeks. So I think that because there's less arbitrage opportunities, for example, between centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges, there's less demand for these sorts of gas fees. I think if volatility returns to the market, you'll start to see ETH burn um, come right back up um, to make it a deflationary asset again. Um, but yeah, big picture, it is starting to become slightly inflationary, but still less than Bitcoin and um, demand is still high for the for the chain. Very cool. Um, and then last, just to finish up, we've been getting some mis mixed signals um, from, uh, I guess, from, from our regulators, particularly around kind of the world's notice from Robin Hood, but then some other things as well. Can you just kind of run us through those those kind of quick highlights? Yeah, certainly. I think um, one thing that, you know, Coinbase has been very heavily involved in is just asking for better regulation in the U.S. Um, we've seen, you know, like more Wells notices being issued. We've seen a lot of mixed signals. Um, we recently received an announcement that Phoenix Wallet, for example, is pulling out of the U.S. because of uncertain regulatory um, clarity. And at the same time, Exodus Wallet, uh, which lists other assets as well, is approved to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And I think that this creates a very confusing narrative for innovation in the space, particularly in the U.S., which has a lot of technical talent, um, a lot of capital to deploy in the space, where a lot of the the money for, for startups is actually being spent understanding the legal and regulatory compliance, which is very unclear right now. So I think that just speaks to how we, we want to have um, better compliance and better um, better regulations in this space that allows good actors to um, continue to, to continue to innovate and and build new products in this space. Yeah, interestingly, Robin Hood, I think, traded pretty well uh, post that Wells notice as well. I, I think it was kind of shrugged off and people weren't uh, overly concerned about it. But yeah, I totally agree. It was. Um, it will be nice to see some clarity uh, yeah, that I'm sure we'll get in the, in the not too distant future. Um, one other move just to mention as we kind of talking about stocks, um, Marathon Digital had a big move up as they were added to the small cap 600 index. Um, I think that's the first, first minor to be added to that. Uh, but it's interesting to see some of these equities added to indices uh, and kind of what that does to um, to their prices. But that is a wrap for the week. Uh, thank you, Dali, so much for joining. Um, it's, it's kind of getting on a little bit later in, in Iceland, so I appreciate you dialing in late. Uh, and thank you to David, George, and Greg, as always. 
Uh, and thank you for listening in. We will see you next week. Take care.